Okay, so I've really been looking forward to this for a while. Um, we have today Nancy Hogshead Maycar, who is not only stuttered and still once in a while does, but she also has something that I've heard of, but I don't know anyone personally who has them except for her, and she has more than one. What would that be, Nancy? <laughs> I have three gold medals from the 1984 Olympics. Wow. Yes. I remember you. You were, if I remember right, in the swimming events, at least, you were kind of the female face of that Olympic Games for swimming. <laughs> um, I had I had some amazing teammates as well. Tracy Calkins and Mary T. Oh, Maher. Yeah. 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 So, right. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah, we, that was we quite had a good group team. you were with. We, we, indeed. <laughs> so, so, and then after swimming, even though you stuttered still, I think, you can tell that story in a minute, you had a really almost equally impressive career as a lawyer and an actress. Can you give us a little background on that and, and how you were able to push through, even though you may have had some, some stuttering there? Sure. I, um, um, so after the Olympics, um, uh, an amazing woman, Donna Deverona, came and talked to the Olympic team, and she said, um, you're about to get a lot of microphones in your face, and when you do, can you talk about Title IX? Because the statute is in jeopardy. There was a bad United States Supreme Court decision which limited the scope of it, so it only applied to the part of the school that actually got the federal funds. It didn't apply to the entire university, so they had to go back to Congress. Title IX, the statute had to get passed twice, and um, so I did. And then that next summer, after 1985, I was an intern at the Women's Sports Foundation and then went on to the board of directors and I was vice president and president and went to law school in there. And, and I actually thought that by the time I graduated from law school, I thought it was gonna be over. I thought <laughs> like, oh, we we're gonna handle that because sports and athletics and as far as sex discrimination goes is uniquely easy to measure. It is, you know, here's what the men have, here's what the women have. It's really hard to show that somebody either was, wasn't hired, that they got fired, that they had some negative uh, evaluation because they're female or because they're African-American or Asian or whatever. So, um, right, we had this really easy place. And, and, and so I, I thought it was going to be over. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> Here it is, 30 years later. Not so much. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us, tell us when you work through your stuttering, and because you, you've done so much, uh -huh. and how that progressed, how you work okay. through it. Yeah. Here's here's my here's here's my, here's my stuttering story and how it sort of interfaces. <laughs> and please forgive my dog that knows that as soon as I start talking on here, that like, you know. She, that's like a her signal, like it's playtime. Okay, yeah. so I stuttered all my life. Um, I don't ever remember a time when I did not stutter, and um, um, and I would I would characterize myself as like you know like a two or a three stutterer, right? Not really serious, right? But not not really. Um, you know, easy. It was definitely a thing. Like people knew that I stuttered. Um, I remember thinking like in second or third grade, like, I wonder what I'm going to do with my life. Well, I could never do anything that would require speaking because I stutter. Right. Yeah. So like I knew it was a thing. I, but, um, but it wasn't so bad that it really kept me from having friends or kept me from, um, you know, interacting with my peers or, you know, it, I, I was functionally okay, just not very fluid. Okay. Then, um, okay, seriously, dog. <laughs> then, um, um, so I was, my, it was my sophomore year in college. I was at Duke and I was raped. So I was out running. Duke has two campuses in between and I got a whopping case of PTSD and back then, this is 1981, so people didn't really know that much about PTSD, but um, it really unmoored me. It, it, I, my normal part of being a great athlete, I was already a 1980 Olympian, 
Um, I made my first senior nationals when I was 12 years old. I was number one in the world for all women when I was 14. Um, I almost made 76 Olympic team. I was a 1980 Olympian. So now we're talking 1981. And, um, and um, I, well, part of being a good athlete is um, being able to regulate emotion, being able to regulate in particular adrenaline, right? So that you can call it up when you need to, and you can bring it down when be chill, when you don't need it. And suddenly I could not do that at all. And I um, was having a really hard time sleeping. Anybody that knows, if you show me a world record holder and I'll show you a good napper. So I couldn't sleep and I was having um, what people would call interruptive thoughts. Um, but as far as my speech goes, I went, I zoomed up to like an eight or nine. I mean, I was almost non-communicative. I was almost non-functional. Um, you know, I remember trying to talk to my professors in, in class. Thank God I had a wonderful um, uh, dean system, the dean of students who sort of, you know, led the way. And um, But I remember trying to talk to them and like not really being able to talk. And um, so because of that crisis, because of uh, it got so bad, um, my mom found this place in Geneseo, New York, with uh, Pat Sacco, S-A-C-C-O. And um, it was a, as I recall, it was either a six or eight week live-in kind of place. And because, so Duke um, redshirted me for the year. So because I wasn't swimming, I had a free time over the summer to be able to go to this clinic. Mm -hmm. And um when i was at the clinic first of all i hated it i mean hey okay so they wouldn't let you call home because they wanted to be able to like monitor you you know how it was that you were speaking and i remember he pat Sacco gets up at the very beginning he's like you are all losers in life <laughs> raise your hand if you're a loser and i was like okay dude i know i stutter but I, you just could not convince, I was like looking around, everybody's raising their hand, what the actual, yeah. so um, um, anyway, so he and I did not get along at all. I didn't, I didn't like, you know, being there at all, but I recognized that he had a skill to teach me that I could learn. So, okay, the process of this being there for all that time is first, they get rid of all of your ticks and all of your things that you do to get out of a stuttering moment, right? So people jerk their heads or they stick their tongue mm -hmm. out or they do this with their hand. Or you, you've all seen, all, everybody out there has seen all the ticks that are. So they have you get rid of all those. So you're, it's called stuttering openly and freely so that when you, when you take somebody's ticks away, they do stutter much more, or I stuttered much, we all did. And then, um, and the, the point of live in and not talking on the phone, this is before like, you know, nobody had a cell phone back then. The point was that every word you said was monitored and was, was part of speech therapy. It wasn't something you did once a week. I don't know, I had been to once a week therapy all my life, it didn't work. Um, okay, so after you do that, then they move into what's called sick cow talk, which is you go, you talk incredibly slowly and you start a breath before each thing. So you learn the difference between, um, <clears throat> let's say, P and B. Okay, so what's the difference? So if you close your eyes and kind of go, B, 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 right? And so you feel it in your mouth. It's the lips coming together, B. B. Okay, one is voiced and the other one's voiceless. So P doesn't have a voice and B does, right? So you, like, when do you turn your vocal cords on and off? And then, um, uh, like, K and G, same thing. Your tongue comes up and it touches the back of your throat and then it comes back down. So K, K, and then G, G, same thing, just voiced and voiceless. So you go over all of the different sounds and you feel what they feel like in your mouth. And you get the sense of, of stringing those sounds together in a, in, a, um, in a mindful way. That's not the term they use, that is the term that I use today, is it's like 
learning mindfulness. And as soon as I kind of got the idea, oh, this is just like learning something in a swimming stroke where you have to really be present to whatever the skill is. You've got to be hyper vigilant on the, um, you know, when you come off the wall, you know, you have to be in this perfect streamlined position. Um, and right, you want to, you like, um, if you've ever done yoga, yeah. it's very, right, it's, right. It's, um, if you've done yoga and, you know, they ask you like to move into your body and, you know, you, you really, you move into the relationship, say between, you know, your hands and your head or your, um, uh, you, right. So it's, a, it's the same kind of thing. You got to close your eyes and you got to move your whole mind into your mouth and your throat apparatus mm -hmm. and you practice saying the word, let's say, I was going to say Larry. So Larry Stein. So I would go. Larry Stein. Right. Isn't that hard to like, you know, make yeah. it that long, but you have to talk six, sick cow for, I think we did it like a week over a week. Mm -hmm. So trying to like order a meal, or as you can tell, I talk really quickly to order a meal or to, uh, you know, get it, you know, a new key or something is not, uh, it's not an easy thing. Um, uh, but, but it is that mindfulness of, it's not just hearing the sound of um, Larry Stein. It is, it is moving into your mouth and feeling every single thing that your mouth is doing. Um, um, it you is, do I do, I do. You do. So I absolutely, 100%. So, and I find that um, the so in, everybody has lots of theories about what causes stuttering, what what it's all about. There's a hereditary component. My son got it from me; he inherited it. Um, right around 21 months, he started taking like you know four or five breaths to say "mommy," and then he would give up and he would look at me. And even though like some of his pediatricians are like, "Oh, that's just a phase," like I knew what stuttering really was. Like there's a, I knew the difference between like, just like a disfluency and um, a stutter. And I, I, there's a difficulty with it. There's, uh, there's an energy behind it. And so I knew this was not something that I could wait on. And so I found somebody to, you know, really help with that. But my point is about how, what I, what I think causes stuttering and what I think it is. And the reason why um, having PTSD really activated it is because there's a short circuit between the, the thinking part of the brain and then what happens here. And it is no different than my father was a orthopedic surgeon who just did spines. And um, he, so he did a lot of like people had spinal cord injuries and people who had to learn how to walk again. And, uh, and, and the, the mindfulness that it took, it's not just, it's not just about practicing, right? Same thing with in, in elite athletics. It's not just about practicing. Um, I think Caleb Dressel, he's my hero because he really sort of exemplifies my, uh, my theories, if you will, of being a great athlete, but he is, he's so, uh, He's so one with the water and he gets there by being really present in his body. Um, anybody who's been through trauma, um, there's a great book called um, The Body Keeps the Score. It's by Bessel van der Kolk. And he goes through a number of, of, of strategies on what people can do to uh, get over PTSD. It's very healable. It's very different from depression. It's very different from anxiety. And it turns out that what I did was exactly that. I did all of the things that he kind of recommends. But what, what happens when somebody gets PTSD is they're, they're, they're sort of out of their body, right? I have, my adrenaline levels were so far off the charts when I was like confronted with this person that I couldn't control it anymore. And, and, you know, I was uh, so 
way up here that um, the body kind of leaves, right? There's like a dis dissociation between, right? And um, so I had to come back to it, right? So, so much is, so I do the exact same thing that I did back, you know, when I was whatever, 19 years old, when I was learning how not to stutter um, is I close my eyes and I go into sick cow speech. And it's, again, I can do it whispering. I can do it not any vocal. I can do it, I can even do it like, and not move my mouth at all. I can just like, you know, who I am is my mouth. And, uh, you know, who I am is just my tongue. And I it will figure out what my tongue is doing while I'm talking and I can, Right. And, and, and it, it, it strengthens that signal between brain and mouth. Um, and it, I mean, you know, I'll be 60 next year, so it's been a while, <laughs> but uh, I, um, uh, and you're supposed to say, no, Nancy, not you. <laughs> and then I can I be like, all oh, great. It's, like, it's true. It's true. Yeah. It <laughs> and, seems uh, like nothing to me. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, but, but but I, I still do the same thing of uh, of mindfulness of moving into my and I can usually like before I go to sleep or when I wake up in the morning I can do it and you know have it be easy now when my son so when when he was a baby uh, and he was you know twenty like I said twenty one months old when he first started stuttering. Um, um, we, we, we went, we, we found this expert who was in New York city, who, um, she taught our family how to turn the household into speech therapy, right? We didn't want to put a lot of stress on his speech. We didn't want to give him open-ended questions. We want to give him a lot of yes or no questions. It's like the exact opposite of like what you do for a teenager. And, um, you want to give their voice kind of a break. And then when, thank goodness I had, I stuttered because when he would stutter, then I would do sick cow speech back to him. Mm. So let's say it was mommy. Okay. So he's saying mom, 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 mommy. And I would say mommy like that. And he would like stare at my lips and focus on what I was saying. And then, right. And, and right. So that's, what we did. And so that was, that impacted how the nanny talked to him, how my parents talked to him. Right. And we slowed everything way down. We slowed it down to, um, um, we wanted it to be a little slower than Mr. Rogers. That was the goal, a little slower than Mr. Rogers. <laughs> and, um, and, and, uh, and after only about six months of that, it worked. And he stopped. And I was like thinking like, I did it. Woohoo. It's done. Yeah. And, and then life happens. He got a bad third grade teacher and she was awful. Um, my son is unusually bright. He is on the way gifted scale. He's at Duke now. He's a, he's a statistics major and music major. And, um, and, um, but, Anyway, so, and, and she like, anyway, I, I could go on. She was not a good teacher. And he started like doing this with his hands. And so we got, we figured out number one, we got to get him out of there. Got to get him out of that school. And then number two is we figured um, that, um, um, that we, you know, we needed to maybe, okay. So we went to the school, things got a lot better, but as he got to be like maybe sixth, seventh grade, it bothered him. His speech was kind of like mine and that it was like a, you know, like a two or a three, but he wasn't able to really participate with his friends. He wasn't able to um, have the kind of, you know, he couldn't like get his comment in like when everybody's like being funny back and forth. Yeah. And right. So, um, so we took him, I want to say he, it was, his going into his ninth grade year, maybe his, like after eighth grade, going into ninth grade. And so we found the protege of Pat Sacco, 
who is Nathan Maxfield out of University of South Florida. I highly recommend him because while I was miserable, I told my son, like, you are going to be miserable. (laughs) He was really motivated. He really wanted to get it. Um, uh, He was not at all. I mean, Dr. Maxfield made it enjoyable and fun. And there were people there who were 50 and there were people there who were younger than he was. Right. So, um, so he he really I mean I have to say that we, those weeks that we we had to get a hotel room in um, uh, in uh, Tampa and we had a really really good time um, and you know I'm like I could help him on the we on the weekends and you know when we he'd come home this dog is going to get hey stop honey stop <laughs> sorry about that. Um, yeah, no, he, he was, um, you know, Nathan Maxfield was great. And um, uh, the whole program was really great. And it's also much shorter. It's only three weeks as opposed to, and it was not living. Um, but, but teaching that mindfulness that um, how do you strengthen the neurological connections between the brain that knows what it needs to say it used to just drive me batty when somebody would say like, just think before you talk. Like, yeah, 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 ugh, yeah. So annoying. Like, I know what I want to say, you know? Right. Um, and so, uh, and, and so uh, Dr. Maxfield's program helped, helped your son. Yeah. A hundred percent. He's a, he's, he's stutter free. Every once in a while, Aaron and I will, we'll just go over a few things together and, but you know, Aaron's got a good handle on it. And, and by the way, I've asked Aaron if I could talk here, if I could write the article that I wrote on uh, the mom's mom's right. blog and, uh, and he, he was okay with it. So he's proud of himself is actually, that's what he actually wrote his essay on to get into Duke was how proud he was of how he had tackled this. That's great. So it was a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was the biggest deal in my life. And it's interesting that, that, you know, you got to where you are in terms of your speech. I got to where I'm in my speech. And I would say I was like more like an eight eight or nine. Um, I I was very severe. But, um, and we got there in two entirely different ways. Yeah. Which is more mindful. Mine is anything but mindful. So it's huh. fascinating to me to hear that. We'll have to talk more sometime. So, so what advice would you give to people who are stuttering, who are having a difficult time with it, and they're looking at their careers, well, like you and I did, I go, what can I possibly do? And I, I compromised my career. I did not go into what I wanted to. Now I'm doing it, but I did not for decades because I just couldn't say anything. And um, right. what advice would, would you give to people who are looking at their future and go, oh my God, what can I possibly do and with having the speech problem? Hmm. Well, one thing I would say what not to do first, which is don't think it's a question of your having confidence. Um, as, a, as a 1980 Olympian, as somebody who was the best swimmer in the world, as somebody who was getting good grades, I did not suffer from lack of confidence. That was not the, it was not um, what caused my speech impediment. Um, so, and, and a lot of times on, like I follow you, Larry, on Facebook, and a lot of times, you know, people will say, you know, what I need to do is just relax. And, and I, I want to, you know, it's not caused by emotions. It's not caused by, um, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with you in terms of, you know, your emotional psychological makeup. It is tough to have a speech impediment and not be able to really communicate with your peers and, and whatnot, but but it's like, it's, it's putting the cart before the horse. It's not like, Oh, if I felt okay about it, then my speech would be okay. It doesn't work that way. It is, you know, you can work on your, you can feel pretty terrible about yourself and still um, uh, have either awful or terrific speech either way. Right. So 
Exactly. Exactly. Right. So, so don't try to think like, if I could just feel good about myself, then I wouldn't stutter. I, I don't, I don't think it works that way. I don't either. I think there's the skill part and you went through your skill part and then, yeah. and then you have to work through, you know, getting through situations in life. And, and, you know, I, I had so many psychological things that I had to work through just because I had stuttered for 50 years. So I had yeah, a layer, yeah, yeah. layer of things. But, but, you know, there are people who feel bad about themselves, but they don't stutter. So, well, I mean, yeah, I agree with you all the way. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. You know, I, I feel it's really important for people to know that, number one, you can work through this. You can work through it in entirely different ways, your way and my way and whatever other ways there are which are completely different. And yet you can work through this. There's, there's always a way forward and you don't have to let it stop you. I mean, your career after swimming is, was just as phenomenal as your career in swimming, it seems to me. And yet you had to work through your stuttering in some sense through that. Has it held you back, your stuttering at all? Um, I would say that um, I have peers who really got into, into broadcasting and who are really good at it. Um, John Neighbor, uh, Donna Deverona, I always thought I wanted to like follow in her oh, footsteps. She's incredible, isn't she? She is, yeah. She's, she's an amazing person, good, good friend. Oh, yeah. and, um, and I did try for about four years. And I think, because, first of all, I didn't care about who won and lost and that <laughs> seems to matter quite a lot if you listen to rowdy Gaines at the last olympics it seems to matter if you care um it's, it's not that i don't care about my sport or that i right it's just that anyway um just it was not it was just not my gig to um to um uh to, to be in broadcasting but i do think that there is a level of speech fluidness. If, is that the right word? Is it fluidity? Or, but there is a level that uh, when I listen to people who are phenomenal broadcasters, speakers, they really have something else that I don't have. And that's fine. Um, I'm really good at what I do. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of glad that I had to... Um, that I, I I couldn't I cannot let's say argue a case by the seat of my pants like I really have to know my stuff and um, so uh, so it forced me to number one write really well <laughs> to write yeah. really well and then really get it down um, so that you know it, it was easy to um, uh, you know when, when I needed it to be there. So one more question. So the people watching will, will um, there may be some swimming fans, but I think for the most part, people who, who stutter and they're wondering, you know, what can I do about this? Or should I just accept myself or whatever? What do you suggest? Okay. I have several suggestions. One is if you have a child like I did who started stuttering, don't believe this nonsense of like, just wait and, and have them outgrow it. It that it's, if you know what stuttering actually is as opposed to disfluency. So a disfluency, what a little kid will do and we've all seen it, right? They're like, you know, mama, 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 mommy. It's easy. It's a bounciness to it, yeah. as opposed to a stutter has like a stickiness to it and it has a hardness and there's like an effort that you can tell that, you know, how a little kid when they want to say, mommy, I actually just studied there for a second. OK, so <laughs> so so what 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 the the person that I worked with, she said that if you can get it before age five, that you can prevent them, you can have them be fluent after age five. The goal is never complete fluency. Um, so um, so we, we did get to my son. We did take it seriously. We did do what needed to be done. And, you know, it was like, just like my dad had to teach 
children who didn't know how to walk, how to walk, or people who were paralyzed, you had to reteach them, same thing, right? So we, yeah. we did it. And so number one is get on it, get on it fast. Don't think that you don't need to do anything about it. There are experts out there and there's a lot of charlatans out there. There are a lot of people who don't know what they're doing. Um, when I tried to take Aaron here, in my hometown to find speech therapy that once a week type therapy, like the same person who was doing stuttering therapy was also doing what like stroke patient therapy was also doing. And it was that once a week, like there was, I, I got it very quickly. There was no way that this was going to work. I had had that once a week kind of therapy. Um, I really, my, my bias is it doesn't work. It's just, you're not going to find it there. And then third is, again, there are experts out there who, um, who do know what they're doing. Um, I think that somebody who says, if you just need to practice good speech, like when I watched the King's speech, the movie, um, that would not have worked for me. Me and um, yeah, so he was like, had him practice like, well, good Lord, if I could practice doing it that'd be I'd fine. Right. It just didn't make any sense. Yeah. But um, so, it, but you need to, to find somebody who, um, who has a, uh, you know, a track record or whatnot and like go and interview them as to like, what, what is the process for having, for rewiring the brain so that the brain and the mouth are in sync with each other. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, so, so I basically had to relearn to speak. And after I did that, it became apparent I also had to retrain my brain in certain ways because I was always avoiding, I was always defensive, I was, you know, you know. and so um, uh, there were all kinds of things. But anyways, so I'm with you all the way. I, you know, it's, uh, yes, it's a very difficult thing, but as you've shown, you can work through it and uh, you can get really good help in doing so. So it's just, just a pleasure to talk with you, Nancy, and uh, let's keep in touch. Let's keep this Yeah, you too, Larry Stein. Th thank you so much for all you're doing for stutters. Um, if you didn't give me this platform, I feel like I know a lot about it. You know, it's like one of those things, you know, when you need to do it, you know, you're all in, you're trying to figure it out. And if you weren't doing this, I wouldn't be sharing what it is that I know. So thank you very much. And the stuttering community will be better for it. Thanks so much. Nancy, great to talk with you. Talk to you soon. Take care. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.